Good morning and welcome to worship this morning at First Presbyterian in Denison and Grand Avenue Presbyterian in Sherman. I'm so glad to have you with us and we're glad to have those of you with us who are joining us remotely. I want to welcome a couple of folks this morning. Lisa Wraith is with us today. Lisa is the uh, regional associate for Grace Presbytery. When we began a new model for Grace Presbytery, um, one of the pieces of that model was to have regional associates who would um, connect with congregations in each of those regions. Lisa is working with the northern region of, uh, of Grace Presbytery and with the 49 congregations that are a part of it. Um, so, uh, and she's been at that for all of about a month. Um, and we're glad that she's visiting with us today. Lisa, I want to welcome you, and if you'd like to say a word, we'd be glad to have you do that. So Lisa has set a goal for meeting in worship with each of the congregations um, in the northern region uh, for her first year. So she has uh, lots of uh, lots of folks and lots of congregations to meet, and we're glad that she's able to be with us today. I also want to welcome Margaret Neely. Um, Deborah Clements is away with the choir and. Uh, and doing some traveling. We hope that is something that will be regenerative for them. But we're so pleased to have Margaret with us today and have you playing. Uh, we heard great things about last night's concert with the Sherman Symphony and uh, look forward to having you share your talent with us today. Welcome. Are there announcements or concerns? Yes. Friends, the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Let us worship God.
Please join me in the call to worship. The message of the cross sounds foolish to the world, but to us it is the power of God. We proclaim the scandal of Christ crucified. The foolishness of God is wiser than our wisdom. The weakness of God is stronger than our strength. Despite all that God has taught us, we still act foolishly. We are still weak. In the cross of Christ, we find forgiveness and grace. We confess our sins, trusting in God's wisdom and strength rather than our own. Please join me in our prayer of confession. Merciful God, how fickle we are. We sin against you without even knowing it. Clear us, we pray, of any unknown sin and save us from willfully ignoring your way. Let your commandments rule and guide us. Forgive us for worshiping anyone or anything except you. Keep us faithful. Forgive us for failing to honor all our relationships with those closest to us and those who are distant neighbors. Help us to speak words of blessing and kindness 
rather than words that belittle or destroy. Turn us away from violence, falsehood, and selfishness. Forgive us for thinking everything depends on our efforts and power, for you are the God who made us, led us out of slavery, and brought us into the community of faith. Help us to depend on you alone and to rest in your peace. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Join me in saying, in his name we pray. Amen. Giver of mercy, you are the cross. Giver of mercy, you are the Lord. Giver of mercy. Brothers and sisters, in Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and coming again, we are forgiven and set free to live in faithfulness with God and with one another. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. The Hebrew lesson today is Exodus, the 20th chapter, verses 1 through 17. Then God spoke all these words, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above, or that is on the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the inequity of parents to the third and the fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock, or the alien resident in your towns. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, but rested the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Honor your father and your mother, so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or male or female slave or ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. The Gospel reading for the morning comes to us from the book of John, chapter 2, verses 13 to 22. Hear now this word. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle, he also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, 
zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Thanks be to God. What happens when somebody upsets the apple cart, turns things over, messes things up, can sometimes be confusing. We look at the Gospel of John, which we move from the Gospel of Mark last week to John, to a time at the beginning of the Gospel of John where Jesus does something that is upsetting to people. In John, he makes three different trips to Jerusalem, three different Passovers that Jesus observes. In the other Gospels, the synoptic Gospels, sin meaning with or together, and optic meaning look, the other Gospels that look similar or look somewhat alike, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they have Jesus only go to Jerusalem once for the Passover where he's recognized as the lamb of sacrifice, the final week of his life. John takes a little different perspective. Biographies that were written in the ancient world didn't have a requirement that you adhere to a particular kind of historicity or to a chronology. Instead, what John might have been doing is to show us this or tell us about this to offer some meaning to what Jesus was doing, to offer uh, an explanation, a sense of understanding of what Jesus was doing and what was happening with him. Just before this, in chapter 2, Jesus has been attending a wedding feast with his mother. The wedding feast is something, of course, that can be expensive. If any of you have ever had to pay for a wedding, you know what's involved. A wedding in Jesus' day is something that could last seven days, where you're hosting people for a whole week. And here are Jesus and his mother participating in this feast when they run out of wine on the first day. His mother nudges him. You can do something. You can, you can change this. You can have this situation not be spoiled. Jesus doesn't really want to do it, but after being nudged by his mother, he goes and visits with the wine steward. They go and take the purification water with the, the purification jugs filled with that water, and he changes the water into wine something between 120 and 180 gallons of wine, an incredible thing. It's part of saying, I think in some ways, something about the abundance of God's grace rather than the scarcity that it might uh, be otherwise experienced as if it's, if it's kept in confined quarters, if it's only available to certain people. Here's Jesus conveying a sense of abundance and plenty about God's grace. So they move from this wedding feast, this expensive time that could have easily been spoiled after running out of wine, to John showing us Jesus making, making an appearance at the Passover of the Jews, he says, the first Passover that Jesus attends in Jerusalem. One of the things that John may be doing as he's saying this is John is, is writing this gospel as the latest of the gospels, probably somewhere between the year 90 and 100. So part of what John is doing is he's telling people about this happening some 60 years at least after Jesus' death. He's wanting to convey something to them about the importance of the Passover, and recognizing that this is the Jewish Passover that Jesus attended and was participating in in this first visit to Jerusalem. It's also maybe a way of John recognizing that they're now participating in the Christian Passovers some 60 years later, participating in a different way, recognizing the ways in which God is setting them free in the settings that they're in, where significant things have happened. One of the things that happened is that in 70, after four years of the Jewish insurrection, 
the temple was destroyed by the Romans. The temple that, that um, Herod the Great and his son Herod Antipas had worked on for some 50 or 60 years was destroyed. That was how they put an end to the Jewish insurrection. So some 20, 25, maybe 30 years later, John is reflecting on, his, uh, on this with his followers as he's reminding them of Jesus making a visit to the temple. When Jesus went to the temple, he saw some things happening and he was upset by it. What was happening was that people were supposed to come to Jerusalem to be forgiven of their sins. It was an adaptation that took place over time where people stopped sacrificing in their own synagogues. They, they went to the temple in Jerusalem and sacrificed there. They might do that maybe once a year at the Passover. They did that so that their relationship with God could be made right. And how you did it was you took an animal. That animal then represented you and your sins. You sacrificed the animal to God. And as the smoke arose, it was as though your sins were being lifted. Your relationship was made right with God through this sacrifice, this representation of you and the sins that you had forgiven, that you had committed and were now forgiven of. But if you go to a special place, if you go to New York City, if you go to Chicago or Los Angeles, what are prices like there? They tend to be a little higher. You try to go buy something in uh, New York City. When Jenna and I made a trip there a few years ago, any place we went, you could not find a hamburger for less than $24. I think it's something like that that was happening in the temple where money changers and people selling the animals that would be sacrificed, instead of, of course, bringing an animal with you from all the way up in Galilee, from Nazareth or Capernaum or some other place, you would go down to Jerusalem, you would buy an animal there, and then sacrifice the animal in that place, and there at the temple, your sins would be forgiven. You would have been atoned. You would have been made at one with God. Your relationship would be right again. But if it is that the prices that you're paying are like tourist prices, for some people, those would be barriers. They would not be able to afford to buy something that might adequately represent them or their sins. Intentionally or not, a barrier then would be set up between the people who were coming to worship and God. Maybe that's part of what Jesus was seeing as he went into the temple and saw these things happening, found a rope, made a whip out of it, and chased the cattle away turned over the tables, dumped the money onto the street, and then let the, the doves go free. Jesus was doing that because he saw this kind of corruption, this, this thing that was in the way of the relationship between the people and God there in the temple. And what he was doing, I think, in some ways, was claiming the temple for himself claiming ownership of the temple, cleansing it of that corruption, wanting things to happen in a new way. He was also identifying himself with the temple. The disciples were paying close attention. One of the things that was said was a quote from Psalm 69. Zeal for your house will consume me. Zeal for your house will consume me. He's coming into the temple with a sense of zeal. And saying this, he's recognizing that in the end, the ministry that he's called to do, the zeal that he feels for his father's house will end in his death. It will consume him. 
He's pointing ahead toward what will happen when he comes to that last Passover. He's pointing ahead to what will happen at the end of his ministry. But he's also pointing ahead to, to something that will go beyond that. When he says something about this temple being destroyed and then being raised three days later, the religious authorities can test him about that. What do you mean? There have been people working on building this temple for 46 years, even longer before it was finally destroyed. There are people who have been working on this for a generation or more. What do you mean this temple would be destroyed but raised three days later? He's pointing, of course, toward him being the temple. He's pointing toward him being the embodiment of God's love, the embodiment of God's presence with the people. But they, of course, don't understand that. The disciples don't even understand it. The passage closes with the disciples recognizing after the resurrection, significance of what it is he said. After three days, the temple will rise again. Jesus is saying that as, as a way of having us recognize who he is. When Jesus performed this miracle of changing water into wine, John calls it a sign. In the other Gospels, any time a miracle takes place, they recognize it and use it as that word, a miracle. But in John, John always says this is a sign a sign that points toward something, a sign that points toward his identity. This is who he is. This is what he is about. This is what will happen. He's pointing forward. He's pointing toward something else. Jesus points us toward an understanding of him being the presence of God so that after the temple itself is destroyed, people come to understand there's a different way of God being present with us. As John was looking from that perspective in the year 90 to 100 somewhere, looking back at Jesus' ministry and looking back at what Jesus had done, looking back at the destruction of the temple itself, maybe part of what he's doing is saying to the people there, this is how you can worship God. This is how after after." we've been kicked out of the synagogue after we've been told that we're not welcome, after we've been told that we're no longer a part of the people, this is how we'll relate to God. This is how we'll understand the presence of God through the embodiment of the risen Lord. And then we're pointed toward something else. We're pointed toward being the presence of God through the community of faith. We're pointed toward being the embodiment of God as we go and do things in the world. We're pointed toward going and loving and serving, toward forgiving, toward caring for people, toward welcoming them, toward meeting them at their worst moments. We're pointed toward doing those things as we become the, the embodiment of Jesus Christ, the body of the risen Lord. We may meet in this place and think of ourselves as the church here, but where we're really the church is where we go into the world, take the love of God with us, and go and serve in ways that enable people to see God's love in us, the things that we do, that's where we begin to see the, the presence and the love of God lived out as we become the embodiment of God's love, the tabernacle, the, the temple that is present with us. It's present in, in what we go and do, the, the things that we say, the ways that we go and serve. And he continues to give himself to us in the bread, 
and in the cup, that we might receive the presence of Christ, be nourished by him, and go into the world filled, ready to serve, ready to share ourselves and the love of God with all of the world. Let us stand and say together what we believe. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us join together in a word of prayer for those persons in our concerns. Let us pray. God, we come to you in thanksgiving for all of the ways that you love us, the ways that you make your presence known to us and send us out into the world to love others. We come to you remembering today the life of Mike Snyder and the 18th anniversary of his death. We give thanks to you for all of the good and kind and faithful things that came through his life, for the ways in which he was such a proud dad and would have been such a proud grandfather. We give thanks for the love that he shared and for the love that was shared with him. We give thanks to you for the life of Scott Simmons. We pray for his parents, Stan and Sherry, and his sister, Summer. We pray for their well-being as they continue to grieve losing him. We pray that they might be surrounded by your loving arms and by the arms of many friends and faithful people as we seek to uphold them and encourage them in a difficult time of loss. We give thanks for all the ways in which you give to us new life, resurrection, and hope, even at the grave. We come to you in thanks and celebration as we anticipate the dedication of the 44th Habitat for Humanity House. We pray that this might be a site, not just of dedication, but of love, of security, a sense of great hope for the future for this family as they anticipate moving into a home of their own. May your blessings encourage them, shelter them, and have them know of your love. We pray, too, for people farther from us, for the people of Ukraine, 
as they continue to sacrifice in order to protect themselves and their families, their livelihoods, and their nation from an aggressive neighbor. We pray that we may consider wise ways to assist them in protecting themselves and protecting Europe and much of the rest of the world from these aggressions. We pray that we may be a part of leading toward a time of peace. We pray for the people of the Middle East, for Israelis and Palestinians. This conflict continues there, but as hope begins to be held out for the possibility of a ceasefire, we pray that the day would come soon when they are able to lay down arms, to embrace one another, to recognize each other as neighbors, as brothers and sisters. We pray that these, might, these things might happen and as they may come about, many different people might recognize the presence that you have with us, the ways that you call us to love and care for one another, the ways in which your kingdom might come near. We pray these things in the name of your Son, our Lord. Amen. Friends, now let us give to God the Lord's tithes and our offerings. Friends, this is the table of the Lord, and we invite to this table all whom God would invite. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. Let us pray. O holy God, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, with joy we give you thanks and praise. We need not hide ourselves from you, before whose justice none can stand. Your mercy was proclaimed by the apostles and the prophets and shown forth to us in Jesus Christ. You give your law to guide us and you promise new life for all that we may live to serve you among our neighbors in all we do and say. How wonderful are your ways, almighty God. How marvelous is your name, O Holy One. You alone are God. Therefore, with apostles and prophets and that great cloud of witnesses who live for you beyond all time and space, we lift our hearts in joyful praise, saying together, Holy, 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 Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. In remembrance of your acts of mercy in Jesus Christ, we take this bread and this wine and celebrate his dying and rising as we await the day of his coming. With thanksgiving, we offer our very selves to you to be a living and holy sacrifice dedicated to your service. Let us proclaim the mystery of the faith. Christ, Christ has died. died. Christ, Christ is risen. Christ, Christ will come again. again. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these your gifts of bread and wine. That the bread we break and the cup we bless may be the communion of the body and blood of Christ, a foretaste of Christ's heavenly banquet, through Christ, with Christ, in Christ. In the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor are yours, almighty God, forever and ever. Amen. Friends, our Lord on the night of his arrest took bread and after giving thanks broke it and said, this is my body, which is given for you. Take and eat this in remembrance of me.
In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and after giving thanks, poured it and said, this is the cup of the new covenant sealed in my blood. Every time you drink of it, do this in remembrance of me. Friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. Come and be nourished by them. Friends, let us pray. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Friends, now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Maker, and the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. The Lord be with us. The Lord be with us all.